Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Gary Matola, and I am the research director at the FINRA Investor Education Foundation. It is um, really nice to be here. The, the Cherry Blossom is, is always a stellar event, and this year is absolutely no different. It's, it's been wonderful presentations and, and nice, uh, nice meeting so many people. Um, so excited to moderate this panel. We have two great papers um, addressing some important topics. Uh, the first will be Christina Zhu talking about 529 plans, and then we'll have uh, Daniel Grodzicki talking about student loans and, uh, and the intersection with credit cards. Uh, this will proceed just like all the other sessions, 20 minutes for t uh, presentation, 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, just raise your hands for the Q&A and kind of we'll, we'll pick you out. So um, with no further ado, Christina, uh, the floor is indeed yours. Thank you very much, Gary. All right, thank you so much for having me here, for including our paper in the conference program. Um, it's so nice to be here. I'm Christina Zhu. I'm an assistant professor of accounting at the Wharton School. And it's, it's so nice to be amongst like all these different scholars and people in industry and policymakers because I think we are often a little bit siloed in our, you know, in our individual field. So I've already learned so much today from talking to you, to, from listening to these um, great, great presentations. So without further ado, um, this is a relatively new paper. It's on 529 plans. It's uh, joint work with James Lee, who's a doctoral student in the accounting department, and Olivia Mitchell, who I think no, needs no introduction. Um, so we, we have two main big research questions. The first one is how are households 529 college savings um, plan assets distributed? And in particular, do we see that some households are making suboptimal decisions when it comes to which plans they're opening accounts in? And to what extent do we see this suboptimal investment after you make the decision to invest in a uh, 529 college savings plan? the location decision, like how, how much suboptimality are we seeing? And then we want to explain, you know, if we do find this suboptimality, to what extent can we explain this with information processing friction? So this is where my, my interest in, in the accounting world comes in, information processing frictions. How do people process information? And do we see that kind of play out in this um, suboptimal decision making? So just a little bit of background on 529 college savings plans. So households can, can finance their um, children's education through a variety of methods. I think it's no secret that in the US, college education is incredibly expensive. The average public four-year college program costs over $100,000. Private is over $200,000. That's a really big number. Uh, they can finance their children's education through many different methods, right? Loans, work-study programs, scholarships, grants. And then in this paper, we're looking at 529 college savings accounts. So we're not looking at how people decide between these different methods of financing their children's education. We're looking in particular at 529 college savings accounts. So these are sp state sponsored accounts. They're designed to encourage household savings for their beneficiaries' future education expenses. Uh, the, the use of these accounts has grown a lot in the last decade or so, or actually, I guess, 20 years. My, my sense of time is wrong. So $22 billion in June of 2002, and it's grown to $480 billion as of the end of 2021. So these are state-sponsored uh, plans. So 49 states in our sample period have a 529 plan. So Wyoming at one point did, but now no longer does, and also District of Columbia. So these are plans administered internally by the state, it's contracted to a record keeper such as a census or an asset manager like BlackRock. And households can choose to invest in any state's plan. So this is actually key to our study here. Without, so some, a few plans do have residency restrictions, but most plans allow anyone to invest in the plan. So there are tax advantages to these 529 plans. Uh, the household would invest with after-tax dollars, and some states give tax deductions for contributing to 529 plans. Some states give matching grants. These are all things that we are going to incorporate into our analysis. So there is quite a bit of variation in the tax benefits across the states. So some states offer tax parity, meaning there is a, an in-state benefit regardless of which state's plan you go to. There are some tax-neutral states, 
And then there are states with just the in-state tax benefit. So this growth is going to be tax-free. The distribution is also tax-free if it's used for qualified education expenses. And as we're seeing with the new Secure 2.0 Act, which you know, obviously is not in our sample, um, this distribution can also be rolled over into a Roth, um, Roth IRA plan, which obviously is not in our sample, but that's also very interesting to us. So there are prepaid plans and there are also investment plans. So a prepaid plan is basically the household purchasing a unit of a future, a future tuition at state set prices, uh, but they can you know, use that money for, for any university. There, the investment plan is probably what we typically think of when we think of these savings plans. So you purchase funds that appreciate over time. There are also direct sold plans, there are advisor sold plans, Direct sold means you would just purchase the plan online or through mail, it's a self-managed allocation. And then the advisor sold plans are purchased through a financial advisor, it's an advisor managed allocation. And we, will, we, we have both in our sample. So this is, a very, this is an economically important setting in and of itself. But from a research, researcher perspective, it also has some advantages for studying what we want to study. So first, only households can open 529 accounts. And this is very interesting because in a lot of other studies, you know, looking at retail investors, for example, without proprietary data, you really can't get at household behavior. A, a lot of the data, it, it's just hard to identify households when it's like a lot of institutions trading as well. But here, only households can open 529 accounts. So we're looking at household behavior. Many states offer more than one plan. So when it comes to exploiting, uh, you know, trying to understand why there is this suboptimal investment, we can control for the state uh, and look at within state differences uh, because many states offer more than one plan. And many states also offer both direct sold and advisor sold plans. Almost always the advisor sold plan is the more expensive one. So this helps us link the information processing frictions that we're interested in with advice seeking and how expensive that advice seeking can be. So first research question, right? Do households make suboptimal investment decisions? And we are defining a suboptimal investment decision as an opening of an in-state account when the household can earn a higher expected payoff by opening an out-of-state account. So that's just very simply defined. And in terms of the decision-making process, first, the household has to decide whether or not they want to participate in a 529 plan and open an account. That's not the decision that we look at because what we look at is conditional on that. Where do they open the account? Like which state's account do they open, uh, which state's plan do they open an account in? And then of course they have to make a decision of how much to invest. We make some, some different assumptions and try to get at the uh, suboptimal investment by, with, with different sorts of assumptions on that second, third step. So in terms of modeling the location decision, we first wanna figure out what is the optimal plan for each household to invest in. Okay, so basically, you know, time zero, the payoff is just going to be the contribution. The payoff in each period is going to be the previous payoff times a uh, return minus any, you know, fees. And then the terminal payoff will be you know, basically that move, move forward plus whatever distribution taxes, if there are any distribution taxes on that. So we have, if, if you think about this very simply, it's almost like a 50 by 50 grid where you know, we have households living in all of those, those 49 states that we're looking at plus DC, and then they could invest in any of those plans. And we're basically trying to figure out like, what's the optimal plan for each of those states. And then we can also calculate this dollar welfare loss. So this is very simply put, it's just how much the household is giving up by investing in you know, their, their own state or whatever state they're investing in um, versus the optimal plan for them. So in terms of the inputs to this model of the location decision, we use some numbers that we have seen in a lot of the disclosure documents of the state's plan. So this is from Michigan in 2020. So they give examples to a potential household who wants to invest in the plan. And they say, let's say you invest $10,000. That's why we use $10,000 in our modeling. 
Uh, your investment has a 5% return each year. We read through a lot of these disclosure documents and that's just the number that people give. Right? You assume a 5% return each year, uh, operating expenses remain the same, and then uh, they're assuming that if you do have a distribution, uh, you are paying for qualified higher education expenses. So we take data on 529 plan characteristics, assets under management, open accounts, and state level data, a variety of data sets, including um, the, na the National Financial Capability Survey, the N M NFCS, which we have heard about today already, uh, to when we look at some of our later, uh, later tests. Okay. So our sample 2010 to 2020, we have 803 plan years which encompass 117 unique plans. Uh, once again, it's 49 US states because currently Wyoming doesn't have a plan that they offer plus DC. And in 2020, households held 14.9 million open accounts with a total of $425 billion in assets. So this is very big. So let me just give you a few examples of what comes out of the model. Like what are the optimal classification? Okay, so I just picked some random states and some of them are not so random because I obviously went to Pennsylvania where I, where I came from. So Alabama, the optimal plan for an Alabama resident would be the Alabama College Counts 529 Fund Direct Sold Plan. And one of the reasons why that one is optimal is that Alabama has a tax deduction. Okay, so go to Alabama. If you, if, you, um, if you live in Alabama, just use the Alabama plan. Maine, what comes out of the model is Maine's next gen college investing plan. And the reason for that is that Maine offers multiple matching grants, but only for their in-state residents, residents. So that's why that one is Maine. California, we see it's the California Scholar Share College Savings Plan. And for this one, this is because California offered the best plan nationwide without residency restrictions. Once again, very few plans have residency restrictions, but when it comes to the ones without residency restrictions, which is most of the sample, California wins. And that's because California has the lowest asset-based fees and no additional fees on top of that. And then Pennsylvania, so all these examples I've given you so far are just you know, in the in-state plan, right? For Pennsylvania, if we look across the sample, the optimal plan for a Pennsylvania resident is actually California's Scholar Share College Savings Plan for the same reason that I just mentioned. It's because California offers the best plan nationwide at the end of our sample, very low fees. And then we look at Pennsylvania, which offers tax parity, which means that this benefit, this tax benefit would be, the Pennsylvania resident would get this tax benefit for investing in any state's plan, basically. Okay, so this is just, these are just examples of what comes out of the model. Then we take a step back and we say, okay, so how much suboptimal investment are we getting? By looking at the open accounts and looking at the assets under management in these accounts, how much are we seeing? And we're seeing quite a big amount. It's about you know, 60 to 80% throughout the years are suboptimally invested. And the way we define suboptimal investment, because of course, we're kind of assuming that if you're in Alabama, you open an Alabama plan, but we're looking at something that's suboptimal for anyone to invest in. So basically, no one should be investing in this plan. It doesn't matter where they live. So this should be somewhat of a lower bound because of course there are plans where you know some people should be investing in them, some people shouldn't, but we, don't, we just don't look at that because we can't observe where people live. So in terms of suboptimal investment as of the end of 2020, this is about 8.9 million accounts and it amounts to $281 billion. We also calculate the dollar welfare loss because you know maybe we see a lot of suboptimal investment in terms of number of accounts, but what about these differences in fees? Are they really amounting to that much? And it is, okay? So this dollar welfare loss, uh, I'm trying to read this. So I think it's about $37.7 billion if you, act, if you kind of project this loss over 18 years. So reassuringly, it is going down a little bit over time in terms of the, the percent of total assets, but it still is relatively high. So we do this ex post performance test because, of course, these inputs to the model, this 5% expected return, is uh, it, it's possible that this is not really the return that the household expects, okay? So perhaps these households have some expectation 
or some information advantage, like a local information advantage, where they know that their own state's plan is just going to do better. So let's take a look at the ex post realized returns of the our model's suboptimal classifications, compare them to the optimal classified plans, and see if we still see this difference, right? Instead of an expected projected loss, what is the actual loss if you were invested in these suboptimal plans? And this is a pretty big difference. So the difference between the optimal plan and the suboptimal plan's uh, sharp ratio is about 5% over three years. So it doesn't seem to be, you know, the suboptimal investment that we see doesn't seem to be explained by some local information advantage where it's some expectation that is actually borne out in the data of better returns when actually we think it's suboptimal. In this set panel B of this table, we do a very similar test, but then we have a a stricter definition of what a local information advantage means. So now we're only looking at optimal plans with out-of-state program managers, and then we compare them to suboptimal plans with in-state program managers, because perhaps that information advantage is not about the state's plan, but it's about who manages the state's plan. Thank you. Um, and so we still see similarly kind of this 5% um, difference in sharp ratio. So if it's not a local information advantage, we turn to trying to explain what it is. Like, why is it that we see all this suboptimal investment? And it turns out that we, so we're, we're trying to test if it's some information processing frictions. And this is pretty difficult to get at, right? So we use some measures of information processing frictions. Our first proxy is financial literacy. And the idea is that savvier households should be better able to understand how the plan components affect the terminal payoffs. And the financial literacy literature generally shows that less savvy individuals are going to be making suboptimal decisions. So we're going to see if that's also true in this case. We expect a positive relationship between the state level uh, household financial literacy and the relative proportion of open accounts invested in the optimal home plan. So this is where we restrict our sample to those states that have both an optimal and a suboptimal plan. So this reduces our sample quite a bit, but we, we need to do this in order to really um, hone in on these information processing frictions measured at the state level. So we have two measures from this NFCS financial literacy survey. The first one is a more objective measure, which is the test questions that are correct based on the survey. And then the second one is um, this self-assessed self uh, like a, a less objective measure, a more subjective measure of financial literacy. And what we see is in terms of the proportion of optimal accounts, this test questions correct is positively associated with the proportion of optimal accounts. So within a state, you know, kind of the, the, the plan within the state that has the lower fees that's optimal, we see a greater proportion when um, financial literacy is higher in that state. This self-assessed high, this more subjective measure of financial literacy, we're not seeing much here. In one specification, we actually find that it's negatively associated. I you know, don't want to put too much emphasis on, on this result, but, but it could be a sign of overconfidence you know, because it is subjective. But, but once again, that's just kind of what the data is showing us here. We also measure information processing frictions uh, from the user perspective of these disclosures. So, you know, as I mentioned, I'm in the accounting group. We care a lot about firms' disclosures, in this case, states' disclosures. These states' plans have, have really, really long disclosure documents, on average over 80 pages. They're pretty difficult to process. These plans have been criticized as being too complicated. Some of them have faced lawsuits for potentially misleading advertising. So what we're going to look at is how complex are these plan disclosure documents? And it, there's a lot of variation across these states. So we expect that the increased complexity of that increased complexity of the optimal home plans disclosure document relative to the suboptimal plans disclosure document is going to be associated with lower investment in the optimal home plan. So it could be something as simple as someone looking at these disclosure doc this disclosure document, thinking this is way too complicated. I'm not even going to read this. I can't understand what's going on. And it could even extend into, I am going to read this, but I cannot figure out what the fees are. I cannot figure out what my expected return would be based on reading these disclosure documents. And we find that 
using two different measures of disclosure complexity. One is based on the FOG index and one is based on flesh reading ease, which is kind of like the grade level that would be, would be required to read such a document. Uh, we find that both of these complexity measures are negatively associated with the proportion of optimal accounts in that state's, um, in the plan in the state. So this is basically saying the more complex the document, the, the less likely that the household is going to be making an optimal decision in that state. So we have some uh, robustness analyses. Of course, this time horizon, this, uh, this uh, $10,000, this is all coming from the state's plan disclosure documents. But of course, that might not uh, accurately describe how a household is viewing their own investment decision. So we've shown in the paper that this, our results are robust to variations in the time horizon. We use a 10-year time horizon instead of an 18-year time horizon. We find very similar results. Variations in the amount of the contribution, the frequency of the contribution. Uh, we also have a new result that is not in the paper, but this whole extrapolating past performance, which we know households do. They look at past returns and they think, this is what my returns are going to look like in the future, uh, which is not a good strategy, because if you do that, then you actually have lower returns in this case. But you know, we want to make sure that our results are, are not explained by this type of behavior. So once we get rid of that 5% return assumption and we use past returns instead, we actually find even more suboptimal investment, so that doesn't seem to be explaining why we see so much suboptimal investment. We do have a little bit of a test on this participation decision, even though this is not the focus of our paper. I think people are interested in you know, who, what determines whether someone's even willing to participate in a 529 plan. Uh, it kind of speaks to this household non-participation risky asset markets literature. And what we find is that individuals in states with lower financial literacy and higher disclosure complexity tend to have lower rates of 529 plan participation. So that's also an interesting finding in and of, its, in and of itself, that we think. So I do want to conclude, because I think I'm either right on time or maybe a little bit over. So big takeaway from our paper, uh, a big proportion of 529 plan assets, about 66% of assets under management, 60% of accounts, uh, is suboptimally located in expensive home state plans without offsetting tax benefits. The projected dollar losses are about $38 billion um, over 18 years. And really interesting to us, these losses are greater based on the tests that we're doing in the latter half of the study for the less financially literate and the states with more complex plan disclosures. And we think that this does have policy implications because unlike ERISA accounts where you know, plan fiduciaries, plan sponsors are responsible, for um, the safety and cost effectiveness of, of plans. For 529 accounts, no federal agency is currently charged with ensuring the safety and cost effectiveness of these plans. These are really just at the state level. So thank you so much for your attention and um, really, really happy to take any comments if you have. So a couple of uh, comments. I think this is, uh, by the way, very, very interesting. Um, I think this, yeah, this is uh, super interesting. Just a, a couple of comments. Number one, so it seems to me that, oh, of course, this is kind of uh, like just advertising the kind of, this is the typical example where I think like a robot advisors would be perfect, right? Because you can kind of imagine that uh, by just, uh, by only having a few characteristics, you can set up a very simple kind of uh, app that tells you what are the dominated plans yes. for the individuals, right? similar to what kind of TurboTax does for people in terms of uh, the deductions. But the more importantly, I think that, so do you have any information on uh, kind of the trustees or the asset management companies? I think that in many cases, when you have uh, that the decisions are complicated, people may just go for brand names. So you have that um, people may choose like the BlackRock asset management oh, companies okay. instead of others, even if they give worse conditions, just because they don't fully understand exactly what uh, the, um, the, 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 the um, kind of the, the, the details of the plans are. And so they just revert back to the, the biggest brand name that they can come up with. Yeah. Right. Right. And so even from the from also the supply of these plants, you actually can think of maybe some of the companies or asset managers that have a, a more kind of higher brand name and recognition, they may give kind of worse conditions to in their plans exactly because they know they can get away with it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah that's really, really interesting. And I um, and thanks for bringing up this robo advisors thing. I, I'm not sure if robo advisors do such such a thing. They don't. They okay, should. but they should. Yeah, I mean, because even yeah, you could imagine it would be simple, right? Like here's the list of all the plans. Here is your expected return based on this plan, that plan, and and I think in addition to what you're saying, something some friction, right? So it's not just this processing friction of being aware of which plan is best. I think there's an initial friction of some people not even being aware that you can invest in any state's plan, right? So just that first step is already really important. So that's really interesting that you brought up. And this this BlackRock and brand name, that's definitely something that we could try, right? Kind of looking at, um, you know, what's the reason that they're investing in these plans? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd also be curious to know if the BlackRock's you know, the vanguards, how do those fees compare to like a less well-known um, uh, asset manager? Uh, Cause that in and of itself would help us then address your question of like, once we figure that out, are they investing in those plans instead? So thank you, I'm taking down notes. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, oh. <laughs> so I know in a lot of state, well, in some states, for example, in Maine, you get $500 automatically for being born into a 529 account already. Oh. And a lot of other states already have that um, or have started that in the last decade. Um, it might be interesting to see like that initial opening up of these and, and they're opt out. So mm. the default is that you just get the money. Um, like it, it would be even harder of a, a, an even larger transaction cost to switch or to have a second um, open account. So I know right. like the main, for example, one goes into the next next gen main account. Yes, so yes. if you already have that start, then you've already done the right thing, right? So, right. but if you've, you're in Pennsylvania and I believe they're either starting that automation process or already have done it, um, then you're gonna be automatically enrolled to a dominated policy. Right. So right. It, it's, it's kind of tricky to think about all of that at once, but it seems like the, there's an additional transactional cost to having to think about it after not having to think about it. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, so thanks for bringing that up. I, I would love to collect data on that. So, you know. Verity now has a map hey. of all of these that you can get into the weeds with. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Cause you can imagine, right? The inertia, if these are opt out plans, you know, I could imagine just not even looking, not even being, what, why would you switch? Right. Okay. So prosperity now. Um, so yeah, that, that's, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I will look that up. Um, I guess related to actually both the questions that already came up. Um, I'm wondering still on the, uh, in terms of plan managers, whether they have outreach efforts to try to get people to enroll with them, okay. and whether there can be like a supply side story um, to this misallocation, maybe the ones that are allocating more effort to these outreach um, exercises to try to get clients, they don't offer as good returns or are dominated. Um, and also still on the supply side, or at least the characteristics of the plan managers, um, I don't know if if I have a brokerage account and then I get, and then the, the same company that manages my brokerage account offers a 529 uh, plan, if I can get some cross subsidies or discounts. No, if you think about it as a portfolio, no, if I'm already a client of these guys, no, and then they are also managing this plan, um, something that appears suboptimal may not be as suboptimal when you take into account my entire portfolio. Yeah. I, I don't know the characteristics of the industry as much. Yeah, yeah. So this, so your your first comment on the supply side, right? If they're doing these outreach efforts, you know, I don't. I mean, I'd love to see if I could observe that. Um, if I can, then that would be wonderful to to, to bring in as well. Um, it kind of ties a little bit. You know, it's not exactly, but it's related to our test of looking at like the advisor sold versus the direct sold plans and almost always the advisor sold plans are more expensive maybe because you're paying for these outreach efforts, right? This marketing. Um, but then uh, your second comment, which is about these like cross subsidies, right? So once again, I, I don't know that, 
I'm not aware of these cross subsidies, but um, of course, if that's going on, then you know we'd have to bring that in. Uh, I think you know our co-author James, he he collected the data from basically planned websites and like a lot of different sources right. hand collected. So if it's some cross subsidy that would you know not be publicly disclosed, then of course we can't see it. But we haven't seen something like that. I, I guess the identity of the plan managers um, would be kind of like useful to, to okay. for someone thinking about this uh, type of questions. No, if they offer only 529 plans, then there's no scope for something like this. But did they actually offer a lot of services? Oh, okay. Um, so it's very related to Alberto's comment right. about the brand name mm -hmm. too, because it probably correlated. Right? Yeah. The higher mm -hmm. brand name, the more likely. Like you know, you could also imagine an individual having. You know, we talk about costs here in terms of like pecuniary stuff, but there there's also a cost of like not having to manage that many different accounts, yeah, right? Yeah. So so that's something that for sure is something that we should bring. In. Okay. Um, is it on? Yeah. So this is related to Carly's question as well, and I'm sorry if you said it and I missed it, but did you do you have uh, looked at how many of the suboptimal decisions are people who are investing into their own state's plans and how many are um, people who are investing into other states' plans? And are they actually aware that they can invest into other states' plans in those? Like how, how much information do they have from that and can we assume that this is prevalent for them? Yeah, yeah. So this awareness thing is, I think, I think is a big thing. But this is just based on my own, you know, conversations with people who say, but "Wait, I didn't know I could even <laughs> invest in another state's plan." So when it comes to our study, you know, there are kind of two halves to our study. The first half does not make any assumptions about where people live because we can't observe where people live. So we just say this plan is suboptimal for anyone to be invested. It doesn't matter where they live, and then that's the percentage that we're documenting, right? The sixty percent. When it comes to the second part of our study, that's where we are assuming that the plans that we're looking at, like the, those people invest in there are those are residents. So there we're only looking at states with both a suboptimal and an optimal plan. Usually it's you know a plan that has higher fees within that state and a plan that has lower fees within that state. And then we're assuming you know most of those people who are invested in the state in those two plans are all from you know Maine, for example. Uh, in terms of like individual level data on like where people live, we would love to have that. It, if anyone has any ideas for how to get that, like definitely very open to that. Um, but but that's you know how we get around that is by like not making assumptions in the first half of the paper and in the second half of the paper making the assumption that like within a state it shouldn't differ very much across the you know, suboptimal and optimal plans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, can everybody hear me okay? This is kind of strange, you know, the, the microphone on the one hand, the clicker on the other hand, <laughs> and not really used to this. Um, so uh, I want to say thank you very much to the organizers uh, for uh, inviting our paper to be on this awesome, awesome program. It's really great uh, to be here. This is joint work with Paulina, you heard from yesterday, and also uh, her colleague at Texas A&M, uh, Alexander Brown, who couldn't be here. Um, before I get started, I suppose I should uh, give the disclaimer. I work for the federal government, so these are our opinions. They do not necessarily reflect any of the federal agencies at all. Okay, so now I've said that. Let's switch gears. You know, we were just talking about planning for college. I guess now we'll talk about actually being in college. So this is about nudges. Um, this is about spillovers and nudges. And actually, what we've seen in policy over the last 15, 20 years is these sorts of nudges have really become very popular as interventions to bring about behavioral change. Specific to consumer financial markets, what we're finding is that these sorts of interventions are really trying to get people who use very high price or high rate products suboptimally to switch to using uh, lower interest products, right? So here we're gonna talk about credit cards versus student loans. We've seen this also, uh, for example, with payday loans or overdraft and so forth, trying to get people to, to move and, and, and change uh, uh, their behavior. So I think uh, in Paulina's paper that was alluded to uh, yesterday, a lot of the empirical evaluations of these interventions, a lot of times because for data reasons, they really focus on how they affect the targeted outcome. So this particular uh, intervention we're gonna look at was on credit cards. People would look at, well, how did it affect credit card use among students? 
But, you know, uh, uh, Bashir's and Kozowski's survey of these interventions, really, they, they make this very important point, that the Darth of attempts to gauge the effects of nudges on non-targeted outcomes is really a, a glaring omission uh, in the empirical nudge literature. So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to apply a more multi-market approach to study specifically Section 304, excuse me, of the Credit Card Accountability, Responsibility, and Disclosure Act, often called uh, the Card Act of 2009, I'm not sure if you guys know what happened or what Section 304 did. This landmark rule, what it did is severely limited uh, the availability of credit cards on college campuses in the United States. I don't know if you guys remember, before 2009, you would start the year and all of the banks and the card companies would basically line up in front of the bookstore or line up in front of the student center and they'd have these big tables and they'd be offering all kinds of swag for you to go and sign up for a bank account, sign up for a credit card. In 2010, that was all done. And now students just don't have that anymore in front of the bookstore. I remember very specifically, I, I started my PhD in 2009. They were there in 2009. In 2010, they were all gone. So specifically, what did this rule do? It First, it eliminated all inducements to students. So you couldn't give free t-shirts for signing up for a credit card anymore. So that was, I, was, I think, was a kind of a small thing, but actually it's probably quite a big deal. Uh, to get students to sign up for a credit card. Oh, this is free, whatever, I get a free t-shirt. I don't get a free t-shirt anymore. The second thing it did is it severely limited how credit card companies could market within a college campus. So if they were within a thousand feet of a college campus, they needed to basically say when and where they were gonna do this. They needed to ask permission from the university to do this. And that essentially made it very costly for them and they just, no longer marketed on the university. The third thing that this did in the background, um, which probably also had a little bit of an effect on the types of products that were given to students, is that it regulated agreements between the issuers and the universities. There were these kind of back-end agreements between the issuers and universities. Sometimes they allowed kickbacks to the university and so forth, and those were regulated by section 304 as well. So looking at Elizabeth Warren's um, public statements around that time, the point of this was to protect young students from card issuers, possibly deceptive and abusive practices. The idea was that this would limit their exposure to crippling debt at the start of their adult lives. So the idea here was to say, look, we're not going to say you're a college student or you're under 21, no credit card for you. That's not something we're going to say. That's, that's definitely not something we're going to say. But we're basically gonna guide you or make it more difficult for you to get a credit card and that will guide you, especially students that are susceptible to financial mistakes away from these high cost products into lower cost products to finance uh, uh, their expenditures. Here, these are students, the most obvious lower cost product that's available to them is really gonna be student loans. These are not people that you know, can start open a mortgage, they're 18, 19 year old uh, uh, students. So what are our main findings? Um, other work has found this, we're not, you know, we're just gonna rely on other work. I think this is fairly convincing uh, in the literature is that the rule fairly successfully steered students away from credit cards, both in the adoption of credit cards, but also in uh, credit card balances uh, overall. What we're gonna document is that the rule also raised their student loan borrowing and it's raised it by quite a lot, about 8%. So basically, I guess one way to think about this is that not all that expenditures that was being made on credit cards before was superfluous, ex superfluous expenditures. Some of that expenditure was actual real expenditure that was being made on credit cards, now is uh, uh, being done on a student loan. We're also gonna find that the substitution was concentrated among lower income students. We're gonna find that these are the students that are most in need of liquidity. Um, this is, comes from, from our survey. And also we're gonna find that those are the students that are most susceptible uh, uh, to uh, financial mistakes. One thing that we thought was interesting that came out of our survey, I think ex ante, we weren't necessarily thinking about this, and then ex post, it turned out to be a really important channel, is that low financial literacy here is the factor that is most closely tied to car debt and suboptimal card use. We look at other types of financial mistakes that students can make. We ask questions about those in the survey. We find really that low financial literacy, kind of that's the one that really kind of sticks. The other ones are a little bit, uh, uh, well, more slippery, I suppose. We're gonna take this evidence and we're gonna use a model that's gonna help us map it to some concept of welfare. And we're gonna, I'll talk a little bit about what that concept of welfare is. 
And then we're going to complement this kind of model-based welfare uh, using uh, the administrative data on direct evidence of improved academic performance uh, for students uh, as a result of the rule. So what we're going to do here, the first thing is we're going to use administrative data. This is from a large public university. We have about 70,000 students. Important to say that these are all the students, not just students that borrowed or not just students that applied for financial aid. It's all the students in the university. We actually know whether or not they applied for financial aid. We know how much they borrowed and what types of loans uh, they borrowed on. And we're going to document these spillovers from the policy on credit cards onto the student loan market. Then we're going to ask the question, well, OK, was this good? Was moving their expenditure from student loans, from credit cards, excuse me, to student loans, something that was actually beneficial to them? And I'll talk about that, you know, there is actually room to use credit cards to finance certain expenditures. In college, it's not obvious that it's just kind of dominating to use uh, uh, student loans. So how are we going to do this? The first thing we're going to do is we're just going to develop a model that's going to characterize the problem. And it's going to give us an optimal benchmark, and then we're going to deviate from it and look at suboptimal or potential mistakes. Then to kind of understand the extent of these mistakes and also which of these types of mistakes is most prevalent uh, among students, we're going to design and administer a survey, which we're going to link to students' administrative records. And that's going to kind of document these departures from optimal financing decisions and so forth. We're going to then link the model to uh, uh, the survey and derive and calculate some welfare measure. And finally, like I said, we're going to complement this uh, model-based results with direct and suggestive evidence of the rules academic achievement. OK, so first to document this spillover, we're going to use the difference and difference. Difference and difference has a control group, and difference and difference has a treatment group. What's our control group? Our control group here is going to be incoming freshmen. Incoming freshmen, they're going to make their financial aid decisions prior to arriving on campus, and they're going to do that before the rule, and they're going to do that after the rule as well, meaning they were never exposed to cards on campus at any time when they actually had to make a financial aid uh, decision. Sophomores and juniors, on the other hand, when they were freshmen, they weren't exposed, but then say, before the rule, when they were sophomores and made that decisions, they were exposed when they were freshmen, and after the rule, they were not exposed uh, when they were freshmen. And so those are gonna be the students that are gonna be treated uh, by the rule. So uh, on the left-hand side here, uh, what we're showing you is the event study graph uh, with the before time trends, parallel time trends, and after where you can see the jump uh, in uh, student loan debt, we're going to find that the average kind of semester or semester increases about $105. That's about 8% and annually about $200. It's a significant amount when you think about it. Um, we also have uh, results on propensity in the paper. Not everything could make it into the presentation. I think that's kind of important because a big question is, well, is it students, there's some kind of fixed cost to applying for financial aid. Is it these students that are applying for financial aid anyways and they're just borrowing more? Actually, not really. Is students also, we find, are more likely to take out a student loan as a result of, of the rule. We have some decomposition of, of the relative importance of each um, in the paper uh, as well. So, we don't know which students were most affected in terms of not having a credit card, but we still can talk about heterogeneous effects using our student loan data. What we do is we match our administrative data at the application zip code level to census data on demographic information for that particular zip code. And what we find is that the rule was kind of had the biggest effect on students who came from zip codes or, or areas or communities that were the lowest income. Those at the top quartile, we find essentially no effect. There's a fairly, uh, fairly nice zero uh, uh, there. OK, so is this good or is this bad? What's the problem? How do we characterize the problem? In the, in the paper, we have a fairly general setting here. I think I just want to kind of extract what is the, really the insight from, from the point that we're trying to make. You know, you start your school year, and you have some regular expenditures. But with some probability, you could have some emergency expenditures, right? So with some probability, you can have high expenditures, and otherwise, you can have kind of low expenditures. So how do you finance these high expenditures? Some people can just, you know, they can go to their parents, or they have other sources. We do find that in the survey as well. But some people, they really can't. They have to borrow in order to finance those expenditures, and they must finance those expenditures, right? Otherwise, they have to leave school. This is the kind of a really bad derailing situation. So in some sense, they have to plan for that, right? They can do it in two ways. They can 
take out a student loan at the beginning of the semester and hold it in case they actually get the high expenditure state, or they can just have a credit card, and then if it happens, then they just put the money down on the credit card, right? The thing is that if they put their money down on the credit card, they only pay in case it happens. If they decide to take out a student loan at the beginning of the semester, they actually have to pay the interest rate on that student loan with probability one, right? So there is a kind of insurance aspect of the student loan to not having to use your credit card um, in the case of, of high expenditures. That's kind of really the, the insight of the model. And you do get that in some cases, credit cards are better. In some cases, student loans are better. And that really depends on the likelihood of uh, these uh, high expenditure states. So what we glean from this first is that cards are gonna dominate student loans for uncertain, for uh, only for uncertain expenditures. So anything that you know for sure you're gonna have to spend, you probably shouldn't put it down on your credit card. So you shouldn't pay your tuition with your credit card if that's gonna cause you to borrow on your credit card. In a more general setting, you know, insurance can be partial. It doesn't have to be only credit cards or only student loans. And another thing that comes from the model, obviously, is that if you reduce students' access to cards, nudging them towards student loans, you're going to get this kind of displacement. The thing is that this is not going to be helpful to students who are making optimal decisions. I think that's kind of very, very intuitive. If you just take away options from somebody who's already doing something optimally, it's not going to be good for them, right? It's going to be weakly worse for them. There has to be some mistake. So how do we think about these mistakes? We're going to go back to uh, John Campbell's taxonomy of the ways in which you can uh, make financial mistakes. In that paper, he talks about five different types of mistakes. We're going to focus on four that are really most salient to our setting. We don't really think about str strategic uh, action, which is the fifth one that, that he talks about. So this is lack of knowledge on, on financial literacy. That's the first one. We're also going to think about, well, maybe they just don't know their contract terms. Maybe they don't know their own history, right? What they took out, what's available to them. Maybe they just don't remember any of that. And maybe they're not so aware of their own behavior, right? In this case, some sort of not understanding who I'm going to be in the future, I think, is, is, is the most uh, prevalent. What we find when we do the analysis on uh, these deviations from optimal choice, we find that actually for each of these, less access to cards also drive student loan borrowing, right? Because these are expenditures that often students must make, so they will have to take out a student loan. However, the welfare implications, they differ a lot. Um, so this is where we use uh, our survey. So what we did is we had a survey of students in the uh, spring of 2021. We would have loved to do this uh, with students in 2009 before uh, the rule came into, into place. However, we could not find a time machine, so we couldn't go back uh, and do it then. We had to do it with uh, students in 2021. I think really the idea here is that, you know, to the extent that students really haven't changed that much or that students haven't gotten a whole lot worse in making financial decisions, um, this might be a fairly good approximation of what's uh, uh, happening. We also find that it kind of fits in well with a lot of what was going on, a lot of studies that were kind of taken around that time. We're gonna find that about 53% of students actually have a card that's down from over 80%, about 85% before the card act, and about 20% of those with a card borrow on it. That's also down a lot from uh, before the card act. Students from most affluent communities are gonna be nearly 20% more likely to have a card. They are also gonna be 40% less likely to borrow on their card, right? So it's gonna be that actually the displacement of, of adoption is gonna be more among those who are low income, but still those who are low income and have a card are actually gonna be the bulk of the borrowers on, on cards. It was important for us to know whether students actually weigh student loans and cards. So we asked questions about that. We find that they do weigh uh, student loans and card financing, both in the short run, as in how do you cover an expenditure next month, but also in the long run, as in what would you do if you could no longer use your credit card next year? We find that actually a significant amount of students said, well, we'll just take out more in student loans. We also find that students covering liquidity needs with card debt actually are over twice as likely to consider switching over to student loans in the case they could no longer use their card. Do students use their card optimally? And, you know, some students probably do, but what we find is a lot of evidence that probably a lot of students don't. Students who borrow use their card for predictable expenses, like school fees. They also report a higher chance of emergency that is correlated with card use. 
right? So here we actually have in the model that there should be a negative correlation between emergencies and card use, but actually here we find a positive correlation. We also find that actually most students with credit card debt, they have unclaimed liquidity in student loans. And so this comes from our, uh, our match to the, to, the, um, to the administrative records. This is not students that could potentially take out student loans. This is students that actually applied for financial aid. They have received a financial aid award. They took out some of that award. They actually had some of that award left, and they also held debt on their credit card, which has been a very puzzling behavior. They also uh, uh, hold uh, credit card debt for quite some time. So the next thing is, well, what are kind of the prevalence of these, these suboptimal channels? I think really what I want to say is that awareness of contract terms is very, very low, as you can see uh, in the first uh, three columns. It's fairly uncorrelated with uh, zip income. We also find that financial literacy is low. We use the first two of the big three questions. Here we use only the inflation question and uh, the question on compounding. We don't really need a diversification question. I think it's not really relevant to our context, and actually we got a whole lot of variation just on those two easy questions. Only about 44% got both correct. This is very highly correlated uh, with uh, zip income. And we find that unawareness of unclaimed student loans is also substantial and correlated with zip income. The next thing we're gonna do is just gonna tie whether or not you borrow on a card to these uh, 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 four types of responses. The first uh, um, two columns, sorry, columns two through five, the dependent variable is I regularly revolve a balance on a card. So it takes a one if the student answers that question. And what we find is that really the only factor that actually comes in pretty large and also statistically significant is that whether or not they get both of those questions correct, right? All of the other factors are kind of much smaller and much, uh, uh, un much, much imp more imprecisely uh, estimated. The next set of question we ask, well, you know, let's look at students who actually applied for financial aid and let's give them uh, a value of one if they revolve on the card, but also if we identify them as having some unclaimed student loans. And actually we find here that the concepts is also very important, whether or not they answer those two questions correctly, um, but also the history uh, matters here. So I don't have a whole lot of time. I just want to kind of finish up. We do some uh, welfare analysis. Obviously, we can't really talk a lot about preferences. So what we do instead is we find some kind of linearized lower bound. What we find, I think, just to, to be brief, just at the, at, the, at the bottom row there that's in bold, is that first of all, that this is uh, uh, positively uh, affecting students on average, and that a lot of that, uh, a lot of that benefit goes to students in uh, low uh, low zip income. We match that also against academic achievement to measure kind of the impact of the rule on academic achievements. What we're going to do is leverage uh, the heterogeneous effects and use as our control group here students whose zip income is in the top quartile. So relative to those students, we actually find a rise in both on-time graduation rates and final GPA. We find no effect on the type of major. So only kind of on academic achievements rather than in selection into different uh, uh, type of um, different types of majors. So just to conclude, I realize that uh, I've kind of gone over my time. What we're going to argue for is an evaluation of nudge-based policies in consumer financial markets, not just on the basis of the targeted product, but also on the broad impact on individuals' financial choices overall. In the context of this CARD Act, we're going to find that actually, in addition to reducing card use of policy, increased student loans, there's a lot of suboptimal use of cards that we kind of find evidence for. This is just a channel by which the rule is actually beneficial to students. And consistent with this view, we also find an improvement on uh, academic performance. Thank you. So when you're thinking about the trade-off in particular between credit cards and student loans and the interest rates, um, are you thinking, like, do you have specific data or even in your model about subsidized versus unsubsidized student staffing loans? Yeah. So in the model, I think we're just thinking about interest rates. And, it, you know, it could be subsidized. It could be unsubsidized. It just really doesn't really matter for the conceptual kind of development of it. Accruing of not even accruing any yeah. interest for the next Sure. Four so you could just set an interest rate of zero. Right, like in that a, case. But it's different than just like the contemporaneous zero, the like, the four years of future zeros, I feel like is 
that's not accruing any interest during knowing today that for the next four years you will not be accruing interest while you're in school. So I understand that. So I guess one way to interpret the interest rate as we said it in the model is that students have an understanding of some expectation of what that interest rate might be. I yeah. think that would be a way to, to think about that. So we don't actually break that detail because we don't really have data on this, but you can interpret it as an expectation. In your data, the difference between, like I, I guess I'm interested in whether or not the unsubsidized or the unclaimed student loans are on, or subsidized or unsubsidized loans. We can and we didn't do that. We, we will do that. That's a good. That's that, a good point. That's like a different type of question that might actually speak to your model a little bit. That's actually very. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I think that that's something that we'll do. We haven't really broken that up. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. Oh, yeah. Does does this work? Okay. Um. So first, I was gonna say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> But then let's say that you're even in the case where you're in the uns unsubsidized. I, I found it interesting. You said uh, that you didn't think it made a lot of sense to leave some of the money unclaimed in the loan and to use a credit card. And, and I can imagine that maybe it does depending on your time expectation rate for the consumption and the time period in which you would otherwise pay back. Um, and so I was wondering if you guys could speak to why you don't think it makes sense. And, we can now just restrict this to the unsubsidized case. So that, that's a really fair question. I think um, in the model, what we think of it, a time period is a year. So we have discrete time periods, and we think of it as a year. And you, know, you kind of pay back your loan at the end of the year. right? We don't necessarily think about a more granular kind of repayment of loans throughout. So it's not something that that is really kind of included in the, in the detail of, of the model either, but but it could be. I still think that you know, conceptually, yeah, it, it would just you would just incorporate one more feature right into the interest rate, which would be the expected date of repayment, right? Which right now we're holding fixed for both, um, but but might not be might not be might not be that. Yeah, but conceptually, I I think it's still kind of the same, right? There's still kind of this expectation that happens and versus a certainty that, that occurs as a result of, of taking out the student loan. Yeah, so we thought about that. That was actually, that was actually something that we started with and we thought that that would be an effect that might matter. I don't think that's, I don't think that's happening. Yeah, we, don't, we really don't think that's happening. Uh, in the questions that we ask in the survey, that doesn't, yeah. We just we just don't get. I don't. I thought that that would be an additional benefit, right? It's a disciplining effect of borrowing on your credit card because you have to pay something every month, right? Whereas with a student loan, you know, you can just hold it for five years, you know, whatever. You don't have to pay for a long time. You just maybe borrow more. I don't. I don't think that's happening, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I really wanted that to be an an additional benefit, <laughs> but I, yeah, we just we just didn't get that. quick comment about the methodology, about the big three. You know, no. you said, well, I, I don't add the third because it's not relevant to the student. But actually, the big three are very able to differentiate kind of knowledge. And so even though, you know, like you can ask this question about risk diversification to everybody because I think he's able to differentiate basically that basic knowledge. So, you know, just just to know. Yeah. And, and often the big three works a lot better than, than the first two overall. I, and you said, you know, um, the first two are very simple and they answer, you know, very few people answer that. It's actually true for also the general population. So what we think is very simple, in fact, is not for a lot of the people. And, you know, one of the striking findings about financial literacy, in a sense, is just how low it is, right? And, you know, we keep being surprised, but it's true overall. I think ex post we got lucky. <laughs> 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 I think that because, you know, yesterday's paper, they we just asked the, the the big three, and then they still found not a whole lot of variation. I think ex post we got we got very lucky, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 